Okay. Welcome to our first video together, uh, College Algebra Precalculus, in short, uh, Math 152. As we get started with our first video together, I would like to make my expectations clear for your notes. Uh, when I do my notebook checks in class, I'm going to be expecting that you are taking copious notes. Essentially, if I'm writing something down, you must have the same essence written down in your notes. Uh, you must make sure that your notes match mine. When I grade your notes, I'm going to be comparing yours to mine and what I've written down in this video. So don't get lazy. Don't just rush through the thing. Watch with me, follow along, and you will get full points every time. All right, that being said, let's jump right in. Uh, we're going to go over Chapter 1.4 today, Analyzing Graphs of Functions. We're going to go over the vertical line test, uh, review what that means, and what it helps us find, uh, how to find zeros of functions, how to determine intervals where functions are increasing or decreasing, and we're going to remember uh, how to identify even and odd functions. That one actually may be a new thing, so forget that I said the word remember. All right, let's get started. So to begin, let's talk about the graph of a function. So the graph of a function, uh, let's, for example, sketch one. Get our coordinate plane going here. Uh, let's go out one, two, three, four. Let's go up one, two, three, four. Let's go down one, two, three, four, and out to the left as well. One, two, three, four. Okay, beautiful. Uh, let's make some points. Let's make a point at negative one, one. Let's make a point at 0, 3. Let's make a point at 2, negative 3. And let's make a point at 5, 2. So out here at 5 and then go up to make an open circle. Okay. And we're going to connect all of those points. Be sure to cross through 1, 0, and then be sure to cross through 4, 0 as well. Okay, there's our graph. Beautiful. Uh, let's take note of a few things. Let's make sure we label our points. So let's label this uh, 2, negative 3. Let's label this 0, 3. And let's label this, I'm going to draw a little arrow out to it, uh, negative 1, 1. And remember range, when we're going to identify range, it's important that we understand that just means uh, where our y values begin from bottom to top. So we're beginning down here. Let's draw a little dotted line out. And it looks like the top is up here at this point. So we're going to identify that as our range. And then for our domain, remember domain is x values from left to right. So it looks like we're starting from the left here at this point. So let's draw some dotted lines out. Okay, it looks like we got our graph going pretty well. Now let's answer some questions. So say we were asked, First, to part A, find f of negative 1 and of 2. Uh, find the domain. And lastly, find the range. Okay. So to answer each piece here, uh, let's start with f of negative 1. Well, check it out. f of negative 1. Remember, that would be our input or our x value. And it looks like when our x value is negative 1, 
we have a point there at negative 1, 1. So we can just say f of negative 1 equals 1. And we can say given that negative 1, 1 is a point on the graph. And we can also say f of 2, well again if we look at the point when x equals 2, our y value is negative 3. And again we can say given that 2 comma negative 3 is a point on the graph. And next we'll talk about the domain And what we can say here is, looking at our blue, it looks like our domain, all of our x values from left to right, begin at this value. And this value of x is negative 1. They begin at negative 1, and they go all the way across to, oh, 5. That's the point 5. Let's make sure we label that. Whoops. That's the point 5, too, that open circle. So it looks like we go from negative 1 to 5. So when we talk about our domain, we're going to say d for domain. And we're going to say all x in the interval. And then we're going to make our interval. We're going to make it include negative 1 and go to 5. But see how we have an open circle at 5? Oh, now here. We go from negative 1, and we can include negative 1 because it's closed, but then we go out to 5, and we can't include 5 because it's open. So our interval is going to be bracket negative 1 to 5, and then we use a parenthesis. Our range, again, a defined range by going from bottom to top of our graph. It looks like the bottom of our graph is here at negative 3. And we go up to the point 0, 3. So for our y's, we began at negative 3. We ended at positive 3. We have closed circles on both ends. So we can say our range is going to be all y in the interval negative 3 to 3. And that's just a quick review of domain and range. Uh, now let's talk about the vertical line test. And remember what the vertical line test does essentially is it determines whether a graph is 1, 2, 1. If a graph has that single output for every input. And now let's take a look at some example graphs. So say we had something like a parabola. Right, that nice U shape. Now let's draw that vertical line test through it. Here's our vertical dotted line and check it out. Uh, when our line crossed through it, it touched at only one place. That means, we can do a little check mark, it passes, it's one to one, and it's a function. Cool. If we do something else though, if we put that parabola kind of on its side, so say we had something like plus or minus square root of x, that would look something like this, right? Our parabola on its side. If we do the same thing, if we draw a vertical line through this guy, uh-oh, check out what happened. It did not cross at just one place, it crossed at two. So that means Wah, wah, wah. It fails. We'll say fail. And it is not one to one. So it is not a function. 
Let's do a different uh, example real quick. So if we did something like this, let me get a different piece of paper and kind of see through that one. If we had a graph that looked like this, Uh, let's see, maybe it does something, it goes, curves up, touches and curves down, where there's nothing going on here in the middle. Well, check it out, if we throw a vertical line through here, that doesn't really tell us much, and that's okay. Uh, when we do the vertical line test, we need to make sure that we put that vertical line somewhere where our function is defined. Sometimes functions are undefined in certain intervals. For example, this function is undefined from this point to this point. There's nothing going on in here. It's undefined. So we need to test where it is defined. If we do that maybe in another color, let's look like right here. If we do a vertical line through this guy on this end, this guy totally passes. Check it out. He's crossing in only one place. And same thing over here. Crossing at only one place. So if we look at the green here, we can definitely see that this function does in fact pass the vertical line test. You just need to make sure that you perform the test in an interval where your function is defined. So we can do our check mark. We can say it passes. It is one-to-one one, and it is a function. Beautiful. Alright, moving on, let's talk about zeros of a function. Now believe it or not, you guys have actually already been finding these. Uh, whenever you do that direction that says factor and solve, ding, 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 you found zeros before. Uh, so our first example is going to look kind of familiar. But before we do that, let's make a quick note to ourselves. Remember, zeros of a function, that just means where x values equal zero. Wow, how profound. And also, we can remember that if x values equal zero, that's where our graph, graphically, uh, we can see that the graph crosses the x axis. Oh my goodness, it's not where the x values equal zero. I read my notes wrong, I'm sorry. This should say y. There I was, getting all sarcastic and I made a mistake. Well, good thing I caught it. <laughs> all right. Where y values equal zero, right? Where you, whenever you cross the x axis, your y value is zero. Okay, some good points to know. Now let's do an example. So, say we're given the direction, find the zeros of f of x equals, what do we have here? Yes, uh, 3x squared plus x minus 10. Now, just like I said before, remember that when you factor and solve, you're finding zeros. So, guess what? Uh, we're going to factor and solve this. We are interested where y equals zero, so we're going to set our f of x part equal to zero, and now we're going to solve this. We're going to factor to begin, and we can do that first by multiplying our a times our c. Let's use a different color for that. When we do three times negative ten, we get our negative thirty. And now we have to play around with negative 30. We're asking ourselves, what are the two numbers that multiply to be negative 30 and add to be this positive 1? And the answer is positive 6 and negative 5. 6 times negative 5, you bet that's negative 30. 6 minus 5, that's positive 1. We're good to go. That's what we need. So now we take these two numbers and make them our coefficients of x. And so we get 0 equals 3x squared. Put the biggest number first, so make it 6x, and then write negative 5x, and then write negative 10. 
Now I'm hoping that we realize when we get these four terms all together like this, uh, we're getting a little bit easier to see here that we can just factor by grouping. So let me use a different color. We're going to factor these two and we're going to factor these two. From these two we can take out a 3x. When we do that we get x plus 2. Over here we take out a negative 5 in order to get that x plus 2 in our parentheses. Now remember you take what's outside and you take what's inside. What's outside is 3x minus 5 and what's inside is x plus 2 and don't forget your equals zeros. Those are always there. Alrighty, now we solve each piece and we get 3x minus 5 equals 0, we get x plus 2 equals 0. And here we get 3x equals 5, x equals 5 thirds, here we get x equals negative 2. So the zeros of our functions, voila, uh, 5 thirds and negative 2. Let's do another example of this. Let's say that we had the function g of x, same direction, we're going to find the zeros. So we have 10 minus x squared. Alrighty, so again we're interested where we cross the y axis, or the x axis where y equals 0, so we're going to set the left side equal to 0 and we get 10 minus x squared under the radical we square both sides we get 10 minus x squared let me write that step in not just say it this is the step we just did and now what we get to do is add x squared to both sides we get x squared equals 10 we know in order to solve this we need to get rid of the squared, so we take the square root of both sides, and we get our two answers. We get x is positive radical 10, and x is negative radical 10. Now, it is important to understand that we're finding intercepts, so we shouldn't just leave this as good enough. Let's make sure we write this as a coordinate, and pardon me for not doing that in the first example. Uh, I wrote it in my notes, but I forgot to write it the first time, so let's make sure, oh, x-intercepts, x-intercepts, not y-intercepts, x-intercepts are going to be at positive radical 10, 0, and negative radical 10, 0. And for our last examples, we should write in there that our x-intercepts are 5 thirds 0 and 2 0. All right, so make sure you put that in there. Last example of this, we'll move on afterwards. So say that we wanted to find the zeros of the function h of x equals 2x minus 3 all over x plus 5. Now we're going to do something and then we're going to talk about the x plus 5 piece. But first let's set 2x minus 3 equal to 0. So if we have 2x minus 3 equals 0, we get 2x equals 3. We would divide both sides by 2 and we get x equals 3 halves. Now, here's what's important. We know that we have that x-intercept at 3 halves, comma, 0. And here's why I only did the top piece. If we have a 0 on top of a fraction, that automatically makes the whole thing 0. 0 over anything is 0. Uh, we know that from just basic fractions. And I did not make the bottom 0, and here's why. Remember that if we were to set the bottom equal to 0, we would not be finding what makes the entire function 0. That would be finding something that makes it undefined. 
uh, we can see pretty clearly here that negative 5 is what makes this undefined in the bottom if I had a negative 5 plus 5. Uh, however, negative 5 is not a 0. What happens at negative 5 is we get that undefined fraction, right? We can just substitute that in real quick. If we had um, h of negative 5, here's what we would get. We would get 2 times negative 5 minus 3 all over negative 5 plus 5. We would get negative 13 over 0. But remember that 0 makes this whole thing undefined. So the way that this presents itself in our graph is as a vertical asymptote. So make sure, oops, pardon me, just knock that over. Okay, there we go. So let's make sure we identify that. A vertical asymptote at x equals negative 5. And let's put that into our calculator real quick and see exactly what that looks like. So if we go to y equals and we input our function, I did that ahead of time, uh, we have 2x minus 3. Oh, how about that? Is it still too bright? Let's try moving the paper out of the way. Does that help anything? I'm trying to show you. My calculator's a little bit brighter than your guys' is, though. Hmm. Technical difficulties here. Give me one minute. Let's see if we can fix this a little bit. Oh, there we go. Beautiful. Okay. So when we put this into our calculator, we can see we have 2x minus 3 over x plus 5 right here. Let me make that maybe a little bit better. There we go. Okay. And when we press graph, oh, goodness gracious. Oh, I have my tangent line on. That's why. Okay. Give me one second. All right. Let's clear this out. Let's try this again. So, uh, to type it in, we could do alpha y equals, we could get our fraction bar going, we could have 2x minus 3 all over x plus 5, oops, x plus 5, and then we press graph. That is what I wanted to show you. Okay, so here's what we can see that's happening with our graph. Uh, as we look out here at negative 5, we can see that our graph gets very, 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 very close to negative 5, but never actually touches it. And that is the nature of a vertical asymptote. All right, moving on. And let's get that exposure back up so we can see things better. There we go. All right, working through the kinks here. I appreciate your patience. Alrighty. Uh, let's talk about increasing and decreasing functions. Now, uh, this is a pretty basic thing. What it essentially means is that uh, increasing on a graph means that your slope is positive. Uh, decreasing means that your slope is negative. And then when you have a constant, that just means that your slope is zero. And here's some examples of that. Uh, if we take a look at the following graph, let's label it. Let's make sure we have 1, 2, 3, 4. Let's make sure that we have 1, 2, 3, 4 as well. So call that one 3. Let's make a point at 0, 1, at 2, 1, 
at 4-4. Four, four. And let's make one at negative 2, 4 as well. All right, we connect all those points. And we can see some interesting stuff happening. Uh, from here to here, we can see that our slope is going downwards. Our line's going downwards. Our slope is negative. So from this point to this point, we say decreasing. Uh, from here in the middle, what we can say, since our slope is zero, since our line is horizontal, we call this one constant. And lastly, this section over here, we can see our line is going upwards, so our slope is going to be a positive number. That means we are increasing. If we do some examples of this, we can get a little bit more detailed with our intervals. So, our direction is going to be to describe the increasing or decreasing behavior of the graphs. And what we're going to do is look first at the following graph. We're going to label 1, 1, 1, and 1, 1, 1, negative 1, and negative 1. And we're going to look at a just very like classic sort of cubic function. And what we can see is going on here is that from here to here, it's going up. From here to here, it's going up. It never goes completely horizontal. It never goes downwards. So we can say f of x is increasing over the interval from negative infinity to positive infinity. For all of our x values, this thing's going to be increasing. Uh, if we have something that looks a little bit different, let's say we have our graph from negative 2, positive 2. Let's just keep going with the 2's here. Uh, let's make sure we put a point at negative 1, 2 and at 1, negative 2. All right, here's what our graph's going to be doing. It's going to go up. It's going to cross at the origin. It's going to touch that point that we made before, and it's going to go and get close to 2. And some interesting things are happening with this one. We can see that there are some clear sections where this thing is going up and down, where this thing has positive and negative slope. We can see that from here to the dotted line, it's going upwards. It has a positive slope. So we can say, first of all, that our function is increasing from here to here. So from is increasing over the interval from negative infinity all the way to that point we made. Let's label that point negative 1, 2, all the way to negative 1. And then check it out again. It also increases after the point 1, negative 2. So on our x values, it looks like it's going up from negative infinity all the way to negative 1. And it starts going up again from 1 onward. So we can call this the union of negative infinity to negative 1 and from 1 to positive infinity. Those are all the values that's going upwards. It starts to go down though between here and here. So we're going to label this interval. We're going to say f of x is decreasing from negative 1 to 1. Okay. So, let's 
see, a uh, relative minimum and maximum of functions. Uh, let's take a look at the function f of x equals 3x squared minus 4x minus 2 and it's asking us to find the relative minimum. Uh, what your book tells you to do, I don't really like. It tells you to use trace and that's silly. Don't ever use trace. Trace is like junior high math and you guys are way beyond that. So what we're going to do to find the relative minimum is use our calculators uh, to help us out with this. So let me figure this out again. Okay, that's better. Let we'll go to our y equals. We'll type in our function, which is 3x squared minus our 4x minus 2. And we press graph. And there we go. Makes sense that it's a parabola given it's a quadratic function. Now here's how you can find the minimum very quickly. You can press second trace and check it out. It's one of the things we can calculate. So let's go down to minimum. And let's pick the places we want to see. We, we can see the minimum is right here. So we're going to pick an interval that includes that. So we're going to start right here. We're going to press enter. That's the first point we want to look at. And then we're going to press the right arrow. We're going to go past our minimum, get on the other side of it. Now, we're, now that we're on the other side, we're going to press enter again. And you can see we picked our interval. We're going to press enter again. And it tells us exactly the point. Don't use trace. That's very silly. Do this and it'd be exact. So we can see that our minimum occurs at 0.67 for our x values and at negative 3.33 repeating for our y values. So let's write that in. And let's make this brighter again. Beautiful. Okay. So we can say the minimum and we'll label our point that we found 0 0.67 comma negative 3.33. Okay. Last topic and I'll end our video. Even and odd functions. Alright, so we can be even or we can be odd. Even functions occur when you substitute in negative x and you get the same function. Odd functions occur analytically when you substitute in negative x and you get the opposite of your function. There's two important notes I want you to write down below these. Below even, write also known as aka y-axis symmetry. We talked about testing for symmetry last week and we found to find y-axis symmetry, you simply replace you, all of your x's with negative x's, and if you get the same function, you have y-axis symmetry. So that's important to understand. Even functions have y-axis symmetry. Odd functions, you need to understand that it isn't just one part of the function that needs to be negative. It needs to be the entire thing. They need to be opposites. So write the word opposite. Uh, not just one sign changed, but every sign of the original function needs to be changed. Okay, let's go through some examples of uh, what I mean by this. So, let's determine the direction is going to look like this typically. Uh, determine if the function is even, odd, or neither. Can we see that okay? Yep, okay. Even, odd, or neither, let's look at g of x equals x cubed minus x. 
Okay, so let's start to substitute in. If we looked at g as negative x, we would get negative x cubed and minus negative x. Alrighty. So, looks like g of negative x, when we simplify negative x cubed, remember cubed roots, you can have negatives. So it would become just negative x cubed. Those two are the same. And then a negative times a negative will get us a positive x over here. And if we take a look at this, our result with our original g of x, we can see that we changed the sign of everything. Uh, what happened was we took our original function and we changed the sign, changed the sign. So what's happening here is we have a negative of our original function. And so that means we have an odd function. Moving on, can we just move this down a little bit maybe? Yeah, perfect, okay. Uh, last example I'll show you. Oh wait, I have two more, I lied, sorry. Second to last. Same direction if we have h of x equals x squared plus one and we want to find even or odd, we substitute in negative x. And we find that negative x squared, the negatives will cancel each other out to be the same as saying x squared plus one. We take a look at what we started with and what it changed to and it looks like they're the same thing. So what we get to say is two things. h of negative x equals h of x and then we get to say that this is even. Okay, now, last example. If we have f of x equals x cubed minus one, we replace with a negative x. And we see that we get negative x cubed minus one. Now, this is not the same. These two uh, at the beginning and at the end are not the same function. And we also didn't change the signs of everything. We had a negative one and we still have a negative one. We didn't change that sign. So it's not the opposite and it's not the same. That means that f of negative x is not equal to the original f of negative x is not equal to the opposite and from that we conclude it is neither. Alright, that is all I have to show you. We'll see you in class tomorrow.